All right. Uh, thank you guys for hanging out and coming to see this part of the talk. Um, I know I'm keeping you from lunch, so I will try to be entertaining and uh, give you and break as soon as we can to get some food. Um, so, just a quick show of hands. How many people are familiar with Riot Games? Good, more than I expected. That's fantastic. So, uh, Riot Games is the uh, developer and publisher of a game called League of Legends. Uh, on Tuesday, we just celebrated our 10-year anniversary, uh, and we have, um, with that, uh, League of Legends is an online uh, multiplayer competitive game that pits teams of players against each other um, in a timed sort of session where they come and play. The analogy we like to use is basketball. Um, so think of this as session-based play. You come in, you play a game, uh, your performance is measured, uh, you try to win and defeat the opposing team, um, and ultimately get better at the game. So it's not a World of Warcraft where you're playing through a single-player campaign um, or a, an MMORPG. This is really session-based play um, and sport-like. Uh, so you come, you log in, you choose from one uh, over 140 unique champions. Every champion has their own abilities, uh, their own backstory. You compete with four other teammates against another team of five uh, to try and defeat uh, and win objectives with the ultimate goal of defeating the enemy team um, and winning the game. And so we've been fortunate uh, that our fans have really loved the game. And, and when we had this recent 10-year announcement, we went ahead and released some new numbers. And most recently, we have over 8 million players on at peak times. Uh, so we're still very much a thriving game. Players are coming around the world to play League of Legends. Um, we have still 100 million monthly active players um, in League of Legends, which is generating roughly 500 billion uh, data points uh, per day. And our data warehouse is now getting up to the size of about 12 to 20 petabytes. Um, it's a big span because we get a lot of junk that flows into our data warehouse. And so it's not all good data, uh, but it's all sitting in there. Um, so League of Legends is not sort of a, a traditional way we think about games. And so I, I want to call out different bits of how we think about the game itself. So when we figure out where we want to put machine learning and data science and how we want to integrate it into the system, it's not directly into the gameplay. Um, although there are lots of fun questions to answer there for gameplay and balance and how we handle uh, players in that, uh, in a single game. Uh, but often we're looking at this core game experience. And inside the core game experience, we're looking at how we get you into a game. Um, so what champions are you going to pick? Uh, how do we find you nice, balanced matches so that you feel like you're not being stomped on or stomping another person? Uh, how do we set up new maps and modes to keep you engaged and keep you playing new uh, new styles. Um, we're looking at things like your post-game stats. So how well did you perform in that game? Um, what, can we, what kind of advice can we give you to improve? Uh, social features. So it, we are social creatures. Um, we like engaging with our friends in the game. Um, how do we make sure that that's easy for you to do and, um, and online always? And then lastly, a store where you can purchase uh, skins and cosmetics and things to make your experience more tailored towards you. So that's the core experience, and that's where we spend a lot of time focusing our data science and machine learning work. Uh, but outside of that, we also have these companions experiences. So right now, Worlds is going on, which is our large eSport uh, event, and their competition for who is the best team in the world is underway, and we have things like a Worlds Pick'em, where you set up your bracket and select who will win at each round um, and compete against your friends in that space. Uh, we also do fantasy leagues, so we have professional leagues around the world. Uh, you select and recruit players onto your fantasy team um, and play around that. And those sort of encompass our companions experiences for the game. So all of this is in support of creating experiences for our players that they love. Um, and then we also open up third-party services so our community can come in and build additional companion experiences for our players. And so with the focus of this talk, I wanted to look at, at one sort of opportunity for us to be able to do machine learning and data science that cut across the core experience. And where we sort of landed uh, was we would look at churn. Um, and so churn, uh, every game sort of worries about players coming back and playing their game. Uh, we're no different. Um, so we have to think about all the decisions we make and how that affects whether or not our players decide to return. Before jumping into the modeling aspects of it, uh, we sat down and tried to think through what are the different aspects of churn um, that our players may be causing our players to leave or keep them coming back. Um, and so this top one is losing. 
Uh, no one really enjoys losing many games in a row. So you can imagine your win streak uh, is zero. Um, you're less likely to come back and play if you just can't get ahead. Um, there's this idea that you're playing this game, you're investing many hours in it. You want to know that your investment's paying off, that you're getting better at the game, that you're progressing. Um, if you're not able to progress, it's likely that you're stagnated, you're not having fun anymore, you're going to move on to a new game. Uh, as part of that growth and that opportunity of exploring the space, uh, what we find is that you've invested 500, 1,000 hours into this game. That's going to keep you coming back. You want to get the returns on that investment and maybe go on that hot winning streak. Uh, domination. So you just had a really good game. You killed all five members of the opposing team. You got that pentakill that you've been chasing uh, for your entire career. That feeling, that adrenaline rush, all of that drink brings you back and lowers that uh, likelihood to turn. Uh, the next big game. Uh, the game market is quite large. There's lots of competitors that come onto the scene. Uh, PUBG, Fortnite, uh, Overwatch, all of these are incredible games that we play um, and we love. And we may take a break from League to go play those games before coming back. Uh, your friends. I mentioned we are social creatures, so we love playing with our friends. We love seeing what they're doing. Um, and, and we want to make sure that um, you are there playing with your friends. If your friends leave the game, odds are you're going to follow them to the next, uh, to the next place. And then lastly, player dynamics. So this is where we're really uh, trying to deal with this idea of our community and how our community influences whether or not you're going to come back. Um, and it turns out the, the community can't have quite an influence if they're not uh, behaving sportsmanlike, if they're very unsportsmanlike, telling you things, uh, ruining your game experience. Now all of these things, we have data that we can measure on our players to try to estimate your likelihood of churn from, except one. Um, so I'm not going to be able to talk much about the next big game um, and identifying that Riot Games uh, although in our 10-year anniversary, we did announce some new games that we we're developing. Finally, we're going to put the S in Riot Games. Um, but uh, we are not a store like Valve or Epic or EA, where we have lots of player data moving between games and how they shift and move between genres. Um, so for now, I've had to leave that out of our, our churn analyses. So we've got all of that. And then I, I sat there and thought, OK, there are two sort of ways that we can leverage and highlight uh, ways that we can understand our players. So the first one is sort of tried and true methods of survival analysis um, from insurance. And here, what we're looking at is sort of given your lifespan and where you are, what is a, the probability of you turning out of the system uh, given everything that we know about you. Um, and then there's this blog post that um, I read uh, several years ago that I really loved that captured something that always bothered me about churn analysis and survival analysis, and that's the this definition of churn. We're not a subscription game. You don't pay us money to come and play. It's free to play. You show up and play as much as you want. You never tell us when you're going to leave. And when we look at the data, and we'll see some of it in a bit, what we found is that we get these nice big ebb and flows. You come, you're highly engaged, you're loving the game, and then you may want to take a three, six month break, um, and then come back and pick up where you left off. And that's perfectly okay, um, but what do we do when we talk about churn in that case? Have you churned? Um, or are you just taking a break? Um, and then the next, uh, and so the time to event work says, flips the problem slightly on its head and says, look, rather than predicting like churn or not, uh, what we're just going to do is predict when we think you're going to come back. And so then it allows us to sort of just look at overall the, the group and how we're affecting when they come back and when they return. Um, so we we'll start the survival analysis with a very simple model. It's the Kaplan-Meier model. Um, we just look at very, uh, some very simple data where we have the first game, last game, how long you've been playing. T is the amount of time you've been alive in our system. Um, and then E is that observation of churn. So here um, we have to come up with a definition of what churn means. Uh, for this sample data set, I picked an arbitrary number of 30 days since we last saw you. Why 30 days? I don't know. Um, so we patch every two weeks. Uh, so our game is constantly evolving. Um, and so two patches is roughly 28 days, so 30 days. If we haven't seen you in two patches, maybe you're not coming back. Uh, the Captain Meyer has a, a very nice function where you look at the number of uh, players who have left uh, the game out of your population of players and use that to estimate a survival curve. Um, and this is sort of what our survival curve looks like. Um, this is not true data. Um, the dates are sort of made up. Um, but the likelihood that you survive past 180 days is 0 0.8 in this case. Um, one nice thing that you always see in these online games 
is that there is this sharp drop off early in your life. Uh, so you pick up a game, you start playing it, you decide within the first sessions whether or not this game is for you, whether you want not you want to invest in it. If you make it past that hurdle, we can tend to keep you sticky around um, and playing the game for a while. Uh, so that building this gives you sort of an overview of your overall population of players, but it doesn't tell you exactly what's contributing to churn, why players are leaving the game. Um, and so then we move on to another model, which is Cox Proportional Hazards. Um, here we have the same T and E as we had in the, the Kaplan-Meier, um, but now we've added some covariates. So these are things that we know about the player um, that we can measure, that we can use to decide how that impacts your survival likelihood. And so some simple examples that I've given are the number of games that you've played, uh, the win rate that you have, and the number of skins you own. So the skins you own is sort of your investment into the game. Um, and so this is the formula uh, for estimating the hazard rate. So you have some baseline hazard, and these covariates are pulling that hazard up and down. Um, and here, uh, this plot is showing the Kaplan-Meier versus our baseline hazard rate for uh, the Cox model fit uh, to some of this data. And that's great, uh, but we also can take this one step further. Um, so here, uh, on the x-axis, we still have the number of days. On the y is your probability of churning. Um, and what we're looking at is the proportion of games that you've played, a uh, proportion of days that you've played a game. Um, and so by varying that, uh, we can sort of get a, a feel for how much this covariate affects your survival likelihood. And what we found is, uh, is probably not terribly surprising um, if you zero, not played any games in the last uh, two or less, I think this is 28 days, uh, your survival rate goes way down. Um, a lot of our players, if you play every day, uh, your survival rate looks pretty healthy. Um, and you're looking like you're going to be alive for a very long time. Um, and if you play about every other day, you're sort of at our baseline player. Um, so the game turns out to be quite sticky. Players love it. They come, they play um, every day. We can do more than just actually look at these survival curves, though. We can actually take individuals, um, put them on a plot. Here, the orange line um, is actually representative of this individual's age in the system. Uh, so notice it goes up and to the right as they get older. Uh, this happens to be my account. Um, so we leveraged it because um, we don't have to worry about GDPR with me or any of those problems. Um, and so this is uh, me back in 2017 after I'd been Riot for a couple years. Um, and the blue line represents the expected lifetime of me uh, inside our League of Legends system. And you notice there's two, two big dips over time. And what's ended up happening there was, it was funny when we plotted this data and pulled it up, and I was like, huh, well, during those time, I was launching two player-facing features. One was a Your Shop, which is a dis we provide six unique discounts for every player in the world. Um, and so that took all my time, working late night, many hours, trying to get it out. Uh, so I wasn't, didn't have time to play games that day, and, and so I, or that month. Um, and then later, at the end of the year, we do a year in review, very much like Spotify, Facebook, and those, uh, where we take and build up as many stats and, as we can about you as a player and show it to you. Um, and so here, what we find is that the predicted survival rate for me has dropped below my actual age. So it's a fairly strong indicator that I may have churned. Um, and we'd very, uh, we looked at these across. It was always fun to pull up in meetings as we could very quickly pull up a person who is on League of Legends and see how much they've been playing recently. Uh, we can also look at my survival function, plot me in it. So in that time, it just so happens that I, I was quite healthy uh, when we were building this graph, so I'd been playing enough uh, that the system felt that I looked uh, good. And so this is sort of gives you an idea of how we can measure what certain attributes of our players, what makes them healthy, um, why or how their survival functions look. Um, but I also mentioned that we wanted to talk about this time to event data. And here, uh, this plot is a little bit different. On this x-axis, we're looking at each game that a player has played. Um, so they've played, uh, this person happens to have played 800 plus games, roughly 850 games. Um, and then the y-axis is the days until their next game. Um, and so when we look at this, what we're actually trying to figure out is like, I mentioned there's a cyclic behavior from our players where they'll come play intensely for a while, they'll take a break, come play intensely for a while. And the whole goal is here is that we want to provide a signal for our designers to think about how they build features and interventions 
so that we can build more engaging content for our players. And so looking at this, uh, I was hard pressed to sort of figure out where I'd want to intervene. Um, in fact, we look at this first sort of bump where the variant starts to, to grow. This player's young in their life. They've played only, well, only 70 or 80 games. <laughs> and so uh, what we're seeing is that they're taking more and more time off. Um, and when we think about how to design interventions or how to design new features to, to drive more engagement, it would be a clear, this seems like a good candidate for what we should actually target to go after. Um, what ended up happening, though, was something the player came back. They were clear, very clearly engaged for another 100, 200 games. Um, and then we had this new spike where they actually did take a break for at least 20 days um, and walked away for a while uh, before again coming back and re-engaging with uh, the content daily almost um, until we see the spike now where we actually, um, it looks like they may have at, be, be finished with playing League of Legends for now. And so we want to come up with easy, simple ways to look at this data to predict the overall health of the ecosystem, uh, when our players are likely to come back. Um, this is going to be extremely useful for when you finish a game and we want to decide um, whether or not we should give you uh, some incentive to come back. Should we send you in to play a different game mode? Should we um, send you some content to help you get better? How do we structure these things to help improve when we know that we're going to lose you for a long time? We looked at both of these techniques and tried to come up with ways that we could actually evaluate the knobs that our designers have. So one of the, uh, one of the knobs is we run lots of events for our players. Uh, one, this is one such event. This is our project skin line. Um, it's set in sort of a cyberpunk future um, where um, they battle. Um, and so with these events, we typically will run with new borders so that you can customize your loading screen so the players can see that you've engaged uh, with the project uh, skin line. We have skins, um, which are different ways for you to sort of customize the way your champion looks in the game. Um, we have different game modes that we'll launch. So these are different ways of playing um, a different experience for you to play in League of Legends. And then lastly, emotes, which is sort of your way to engage with other players on the Rift without having to type out text. And so we run a lot of these events, and often we spend time trying to figure out, okay, was it a successful event? We invest lots of player money into these events, and we want to make sure that it's the right investment and the right return for our players. One such uh, event that we ran uh, was an email campaign at the start of season for 2019. And we sent two sets of emails. Uh, the one on the left is how far we go in this ranked season. So this was sent to players who've engaged with our ranked product. Um, and we wanted to see overall um, if, they, how, if we could get them back in the system, if they wanted to try the new rank system, climb, uh, get ready for their rank season. And then the one on the right was sent to players who had high likelihood of churn. So we used our churn predictions to sort of understand where they were um, in their life cycle and to see if we could actually bring them back in and get them to engage again with League. So we sent these emails and then we measured sort of the overall change in our predictions for churn. And so this is a chart that we put together for stakeholders to sort of help them think about how they can do uh, these marketing campaigns. And what we wanted to do is we have a scatter plot uh, coming up uh, that will show your hazard scored in patch 9.1, which is the first patch of the new season, and patch 9.2, which is the first two weeks of ranked season. Uh, you, our ranked season didn't happen to start on season 9 at the beginning. It was delayed one patch, uh, so that's why it's not on 9.2. And when we look at this, what we want to see is that if you were a high risk in patch 9.1, so that top uh, qu quadrant, top right quadrant, um, and, you were, and you were high risk, or what we want to see is that you, for high risk on 9.1, you'd go down into low risk in 9.2. We want to see you actually move down um, in both cases. So if you were low risk in patch 9.1, we wanted to make sure you didn't go up. So in both cases, what we're doing is looking to drive people down um, into the low risk category. And the email campaign, really, if you engaged with it, you came back in, you saw all the amazing things that the team had put together for the beginning of the season launch, um, and hopefully you'd stick around. And what we saw was that um, ultimately this provided us a lens for looking at the success of the email campaign. So we did this with both uh, the ranked players as well as the uh, non-ranked players, the ones that had the high likelihood of churn. We saw a very, uh, a, a, an interesting result with the non-ranked players from our holdout, so they actually did um, seem to have better churn 
uh, numbers in patch 9.2, uh, whereas the ranked players already knew so much about the game, sending them the email seemed to prove no additional value. They were already heavily engaged. They were already going to come back. Um, so that email campaign in the future will likely not happen where we target ranked players because they already know. Um, so that was a, a way we could sort of begin to get a lens on how we evaluate um, what, or what we can do with this churn across all of those different parts of the core experience. Another one is cohort analysis. So here we want to start thinking about these new features, uh, but we also want to measure how that impacts our players. So this is a chart where time is sort of on the, the x-axis. Um, and each line here represents a single player. So in case uh, we're using Roger Roger here again, and each dot is a game that I played um, at, the, at the time in which I played it. So this is a, a thousand random players sampled um, from who started in June or J January of 2016. And then we plotted out their life and every game they played across time. Um, and so what you can kind of see is here down in the bottom, there was one more dot, uh, down in the bottom, a large portion of our players play one to two games and then bounce. Um, so what that kind of told us is it's a tough game to get into. Uh, League of Legends happens to have the highest skill cap. Um, it also happens to have a very harsh learning curve um, and a community that often is not really nice at teaching you how to play League. And so we set out, we looked at our new player experience, which hadn't been ramp, uh, revamped since 2014, and said, hey, what can we do? How can we actually improve that? Um, and so what we then did was like, okay, what we want to see happen is if we improve that new player experience, we can look at a cohort and see that we pulled everyone out longer, we saw more people making it further through the system, um, and we can really um, start to measure the impact of changing the new player experience. Now, we've gone through uh, some of these different types of models, different types of ways of thinking about churn, different types of ways of thinking about cohort analysis. And, and the argument that I want to make is all of this is going to be driven by the same amount of data. So if we take the time to get the right data set to understand the state of the player as they're interacting with our system, um, we can answer far more questions than we could if we just send scattershot data scientists out to, to start uh, looking into answers for these problems. And so with that, I'm going to turn our attention to the data gathering phase and how we actually prepared this data and got it ready for uh, use. Uh, talking about our data, we have to go through some ugly warts. We're a 10-year-old game. We're a 10-year-old game that wasn't designed with data gathering in mind. Um, so when we built the game, we were building a fun experience for players to enjoy. Um, we were not as worried at that time about understanding the the player experience, we would just ask the players about their experience and gather that data. Um, as we've grown a lot larger, um, we've needed to come up with more clever ways to sort of gather data and ingest data. Um, and this architecture has been around for a very long time. Um, it is one that was built in 2012 to 2013. So it, it's showing its age in the current system. Uh, but ultimately, what we have is we have a lot of public facing properties. So we have the game itself. Uh, we have a mobile app, we have web properties. All of those are generating events for our players, or our players are generating events with them. Those flow into a public collector. That flows into a system which we call Honu. Uh, it was designed uh, based on some work done at Netflix back in 2012 um, from an engineer that we happened to have stolen from Netflix uh, who had come and done some work uh, rebuilding it for us, and we ingest uh, some events into S3 um, where we have a data warehouse. Uh, data scientists and analysts come in, they query uh, that data warehouse using Databricks um, and start uh, trying to understand our players in that way. We're not limited to the public collection, uh, so we also have the game server. It generates events as the player is playing. Those events flow in through Honu. Uh, we also have all the other parts of that core experience that I mentioned generating events, and those are flowing in through the system. Um, this uh, system is was designed, as I mentioned, in 2012-2013. Um, it's lossy, so at the time, uh, Kafka wasn't really a, a thing that we could pick up off the shelf. Um, and so what we built and decided to leverage, um, rather than allowing the collectors to fall over, if they start to get full and their buffers start to fill up, they just start throwing messages on the floor. Um, now, for someone who's worried about recreating the state of the player, this is a really bad thing, uh, especially when we go to build things like uh, year in review, where I'm looking at your events across uh, the entire year, 
Um, if your pentakill happened to be the one that fell on the floor, your one pentakill that year, uh, it wouldn't show up in your year in review and it'd be a bad experience. So it's not ideal uh, that we're lossy, uh, but it's a decision that was made. Um, the other one is that in, in 2012, the, all the rage was schemaless. Um, so we saw in the talk last night uh, with Pinterest where they sort of made the same sort of realization that, yeah, uh, just playing JSON is great. Um, until, you, uh, until it's not, and people start changing things and breaking things. An example of what that looks like, so uh, this is an event that comes from our game. Um, what you're seeing play out on screen is Zed and Oriana in mid lane fighting. Uh, Oriana is going to go on to get first blood, so she's going to kill Zed. This is an event that's generated by our game server that's sent in as a telemetry event. Um, it comes with a lot of good data. Uh, it's Unfortunately, a dictionary of string to string. And so here we have the game that it occurred in. We have who killed who. So here the killer has an account ID and it has the champion they were playing. Uh, we have the victim, uh, whose account who died, what, who they were playing, where it happened on the map. Um, but you notice I didn't highlight everything here because there's a lot of cruft. Uh, we've got some empty fields. Why? Because game engineers decided to reuse this event for other types of events. So all events that happen in the game server are sent to the same table, and they just decide which fields to populate based on the time of, type of event. Which means as data scientists, we have to know which event we're looking for, what we expect out of that event, and then do our querying in that way. Additionally, I mentioned it was string to string. Um, so they weren't allowed to stick complex types in there. So rather than um, come up with better ways of encoding, they just said, hey, look, we have a JSON. Let's just stick a JSON string into that string location and let someone else figure it out later. Um, and fortunately, it was me who had to go in and figure out later. Um, and it was, it's still a pain to this day. So that's our push side. So that's our event-driven architecture. That's how we get events into the system when, when engineers have decided to push those events. Uh, but that's not the only part of the system. We also have a pull side. Um, so we run thousands of databases worldwide that capture the state of the player. Uh, that are powering all of these different parts of the core experience. Uh, one, these are three examples. So we have our player account database. This stores your current snapshot. Um, and we have the audit database, which is similar to the event, uh, the pushing stuff that we do. But rather than push it to us, they just stick it in a database table and tell us to go query it. Um, and then we have a store database, which sort of tracks all transactions in the store. Uh, we had to build an ETL solution. Uh, when this was built, it was a custom in-house ETL tool uh, that would connect to all these thousands of database, pull the data back um, into our data warehouse. And the one pain point is this player account, where um, it's a full drop and replace every time. So we don't know uh, what the player looked like at any given specific point in time. Um, that data is lost, um, which leads to the fact that I need to recreate the state of the player. Um, this is a picture sort of setting up this idea of how do we pull the data together um, in order to recreate the state of the player. Uh, on the top, we have the champions uh, that this player just happens to be playing. So they play their first three games on Ash. Uh, they're playing in Summoner's Rift. That's an icon of Summoner's Rift. Uh, then they switch over to Leona, and they play another game on Summoner's Rift. And then they switch game modes. So these last two are a different game mode that's, that's called ARAM, all random, all middle. Um, and they play two different champions there, Ziggs and Udyr. Um, so this player has played a total of seven games. Um, and I want to understand what that player looked like when they went into game and what that player looked like when they came out of game um, so that I can actually build systems that can begin to understand the player. And so underneath uh, that timeline, um, oops, I went backwards. Underneath the timeline, what we have is sort of the state of the player in, in some abstract terms. So here we have the blue essence, which is that top row which captures the, our internal currency, which you use to purchase champions. Uh, below that, we have your experience level. So are you leveling up and moving up to higher levels? Uh, we have those two pictures of Ash and Leona um, down below. And here, Ash and Leona represents your number of games on those champions. So it's some proxy of uh, skill level on those champions. And the last one is your distribution around sort of game mode. So there are players who play only a RAM. There are players who only play ranked Summoner's Rift. So we need some way of capturing what state you were when you were playing that game. But I don't want just game events. I also want store purchases in there as well. So here, I know that you went and purchased Leona at this time. Um, that dropped your Blue Essence down some, because it takes Blue Essence to buy champions. 
Um, but that is signal of intent uh, that you want to try this new champion because we have a free-to-play rotation where you can play every champion without actually having to purchase them, but your explicit purchasing them and going into a game shows a lot more dedication. Um, so we built a pipeline. Uh, this pipeline here um, represents a day's worth of events. Uh, in abstract, uh, they're color-coded so that the same players have the same uh, color. Uh, we also have uh, the icon on the left, which represents the uh, game or whether it was a store transaction, and then the timestamp on the, the right showing um, when that transaction occurred. So we want to build a pipeline that sort of repartitions our data so that all, player, all events for a single player are on uh, the same worker, and multiple, wor multiple players can be on the same worker. Uh, then we want to sort within that so that we actually have ordered events for that player for that day. And what we can do is we can load in the snapshot that we know about that player from the previous day and begin updating it with the new events. So we can update the games you played, uh, your mastery level on each of the champions, and we can literally just replay this through time, building up your player profile and snapshotting you along the way. And so that icon on, on the, the right um, of the final output is your snapshot so that we can feed that in for the next day when we start processing the next day's events. Um, what this actually looks like in practice, I mentioned all of those different effects that sort of impact uh, your likelihood to play the game. Um, so Player Dynamics has a, a set of tables where we track after every game um, how, uh, what was your chat scores like, how many players did you report in that game, um, overall what was your experience with the community for that game. We have the state of the game. So here we're looking at things like the queue that you're playing in. So what map are you playing in? What champion are you playing in? Um, those sorts of things. How you did in the game is stored in game statistics. So what was your KDA? How many minions did you kill? How much gold did you get? All of these uh, features of how you performed in the game. And then the post game is how we changed your account based on your performance in that game. So here we're adjusting. Uh, we give you report cards for how you performed every game. So this will tell us overall, based on players who played that same champion in that same role, how good were you at that game. And we feed those in and we join them across uh, based on account ID and game ID so that they're all in one simple table um, that I'm going to call game events. And so you do this one day at a time. Now I have this game events table. And I want to pull together the game snapshot. And I'm going to rekey everything um, by account ID so that um, all the same events for the same player um, are going together. And the snapshot, um, I'm, sticking, I'm here. I've, if you think of the PySpark world, I've dropped into RDD land. Um, because I just need these tuples um, that contain uh, an account ID, an event, I don't care what the payload is, and then some snapshot. There's a lot of waste in here because I'm joining the snapshot to every event um, because I don't know which event was first. And I mentioned I don't want just game events, I also want the store transactions, so I'm going to load up those, join them to your profile, get this RDD of store events, and then I can union them all together. So now I have a whole big pool of events, I have your snapshots, I can repartition it, I can sort within those partitions, and I can start looking at how I can um, start building out your player profile. And it turns out that that's actually quite easily done with a map partition function that you simply iterate over those in the same way that we saw on the previous slide. You iterate over all of the events, updating some state. You're generating an event with the full set of state um, for one table. And then you're also generating the snapshot so that you can continue this process over time. And this is uh, a very simple uh, way to sort of pull all of this together into a usable framework. And so with that, we, we sort of, uh, we have this rich data set now that we can answer lots of questions that we couldn't answer before, um, which feels good. Uh, it simplifies how we do cohort analysis because I have the state of the player. I know when their first game was. I know when their last game was. I know a lot of different details about them. Um, and, a, and our data scientists can use this data set not just for things like churn, but we also use it for personalization. I have the sequence of champions you've played. Um, I can also now incorporate a lot more data into those predictions for what champion you may play next. If you're losing a lot on a champion, odds are you're probably going to want to switch champions. Um, and, and lastly, we can sort of look at this player dynamics and understand, is the community making you play the game worse? Um, or is the community lifting you up um, and making you play better? This is a repeatable pattern. So we can do this not just across game events for a player, we can actually dive deeper into a single game and unfold the same, the exact same pattern. Um, so then we can start to think about player decisions within a game. 
So why did you choose to take Baron there? Um, what was, uh, did you, should you have taken Baron there? We can start to answer those questions internally to a single game. Uh, and additionally, we run a client. Uh, so interacting with your client, uh, we can understand the flow of the player through that system. So the takeaways that I want to leave you with is it's possible. Uh, we demonstrated you can do it. I had to do it because it's a 10-year-old game. Uh, we didn't design it right from the start, so I didn't have any other choice. Um, but the big question is, should you do it? Uh, my contemporary or my counterpart, um, our data engineering side, uh, is at a, a panel in New York right now talking about how you should plan for the future and do this stuff right from the start. Um, and I tend to agree with him. Um, if we could, had a time machine, it could go back 10 years. I would convince them to do something else. And I think, from my perspective, what I'm seeing is the future is towards this idea of a feature store. Um, and here, what we're actually looking at is that we want to stream all your data into your data warehouse, um, but you also want to keep these transforms in this state uh, live and hot so that you can make predictions on the current state of the player. And at the same time, if you build this in such a way that all of your training data is coming from the feature store as well, then you're automatically annotating all of the players with the state you need to do your models. And so with the remaining time, I want to dig a little bit deeper into this feature store idea um, and see uh, what we can uncover. So when, what do I mean when I talk about a feature store? Uh, so first off, uh, it's what's stored, what's mean. I've used feature about five different ways in this talk, which drives me nuts. Um, but um, in this case, I'm going to call out specifically the features uh, where we're looking at an individual measurable property or characteristic of a phenomenon being observed. So here, it's the number of games that you've played on Ash. It's your win rate in ARAM. It's your likelihood to turn from League of Legends. Those are the features that we want to put into this feature store. And if the store here is not the store where you buy skins. It's a database where we're going to put uh, all of this knowledge. And so the final definition is a central data store. It contains properties of other players that can be measured, uh, derived, and predicted. And ultimately, you're building out this feature store so that you can empower your data scientists to move more quickly um, because they can build off of what others have done before them. And they don't have to recreate their own features at every time step. Uh, so what I want, I want a feature store that stores the current state of every player on League, what they own, what they're playing, what they played in the last end game. So we have some windowing stuff in there. Um, it stores derived information. So if I create a time to event model, I want that feature flowing back into the system so that other data scientists can use it and, it, and our designers can use it to build better customized experiences. Um, and I want the data to be returned with low latency so that it can support player-facing services. I want designers designing experiences leveraging um, this feature store. Uh, the benefits of it, if we do it well, um, we can answer questions like the survival probability that we chatted about earlier, uh, the secret store that I mentioned before, all of the features that power the secret store right now are the same features that we leverage to sort of understand your survival likelihood. Putting them in the same place allows us to go much more quickly and easily. Uh, reduced development time. I've heard this at several talks at this conference. Um, we sp still spend 80% of our time in this ETL and feature extraction phase. Um, and it's painful, and I'm tired of it, and I want out of it. Um, and so uh, this allows us to move a step in that direction. And then lastly, um, we have a central team whose job is to sort of help data flow through the system and get in there. Um, and I want them freed up to sort of work on improving that pipeline and making it better and not sort of babysitting our, our Spark clusters that we knock over daily because we're running a query that's too big. Um, I want uh, to make it easier for them. I want them to sort of move on towards helping us find new features, helping us implement those features and get, get them much more closer to the experience for the player. And so in summary, um, properly organizing your historical data unlocks tons of value. Um, this shouldn't be surprising for everyone here. Um, it's not actually terribly hard to do. So if you're comfortable just replaying every event that you've ever seen for a player, you can recreate the state of that player at any point in time. And I can honestly say I went back and started our data in 2009 and had to start walking it forward so that I can understand players who've been with us since beta um, and who love the game so much that they have been playing it for 10 years. Uh, we want to, internally, we want to move towards an event-driven architecture to simplify all of our ETL workloads. So this is an ongoing project that we're taking on currently. Um, the goal here is that we can get rid of this older system that has all the problems that I mentioned above, um, and we can design with this idea in mind that we can 
um, leverage a feature store off of this ETL architecture so that we can power multiple uh, machine learning services and ultimately simplify my life and the life of our data scientists. Uh, so I finished a little bit earlier, uh, but if you want to learn more, um, reach out. Uh, my email address is wkerr at riotgames.com. Um, and if you want to find me on the Rift, my summoner name is Roger Roger. Uh, with that, we can take some questions. All right, let's get to the questions. Mr. Graves asks, how do you deal with the toxic community, which can be a reason for some players to leave the game for good? Yeah, this is a, a, a really good question and a really challenging one to answer. Um, we're moving away from uh, the term toxic. Uh, we really want to focus on the sportsmanlike. So we've, we've tackled this in multiple different ways. Uh, so some of it was we built the tribunal. So the tribunal was set up in such a way that um, games that were triggered or reported heavily, uh, it would be sent to this other service where players that then can come in and look at the offending player and rate and decide what. And so it was community-driven punishment for those players. Um, it, it had challenges with scaling, um, the incentives we were working on to try to figure out how to make it all work. Um, ultimately, we, we decided to, uh, to stop that and see if we could move to a world in which we could punish automatically um, and sort of help uh, identify more players more quickly uh, that needed some, some level of reform. Uh, then <laughs> uh, we, we tried to tackle the problem from the other side. So there is the stick and the carrot. Um, and so we spent several years trying to leverage the stick to improve the community. Um, and then uh, we had a very good designer, Kim Vol, come on um, and try to help uh, with the carrot side. So here she built out our honor system, which is where you go in and actually try to honor other players who played very sportsmanlike um, and were very fun to play with. Um, and so help drive the community by rewarding and recognizing good behavior. All right. You said you tried to engage players when they were about to leave. Is this the best strategy? Shouldn't players relax, and when they return, they stay longer? It's a really good question, um, and I agree. Um, so one of the challenges, we have this, these wonderful models that predict churn and time to event. Uh, what is the right style of engagement? Uh, we have we've not leveraged them in ways uh, to sort of create direct interventions at all yet um, because of this, this primary concern of, like, how do you think about um, whether or not uh, the intervention is the right way to do it, are the incentives, again, I'm going to hint on the incentives, um, are the incentives aligned? Should we be uh, rewarding you for coming back? Should we, um, yeah. And so I don't have a great answer. It's not the best strategy. I, I do, I will admit that. Um, and what we've seen is this ability to step away for 30 days, go play a different game, um, often makes the heart grow fonder, and you come back and play more. All right. How can you differentiate between somebody having a bad game versus intentionally feeding or giving kills to the enemy? <laughs> yeah, this is a, a, a really a contentious point internally as well. Um, so uh, we don't want to punish players for being bad at the game. That is just a terrible experience uh, for our players. And so uh, we, we take great care in trying to tease out that intentionality. Um, and honestly, what we end up doing is under punishing. Um, we, we tend to try to be as certain as possible that the, the intention is uh, that you are intentionally feeding versus you're just having a bad day. Because we all have bad days. I've had bad runs. I had some data in this slide earlier until I saw Andy's keynote this morning um, that you wouldn't have been able to read uh, that had sort of this, this player's transition into his, uh, his first game of PvP or his or her first game of PvP. And they go from this nice KDA of three, four, five, where they're getting four times as many kills as they are deaths. And what ends up happening is in their first PvP game, they have a KDA of 0 0.2. So they, it was a terrible experience. They simply got stomped. Um, and then they left that game mode and moved on to a different one. So it, um, we definitely know that it's there. Uh, teasing out intentionality can be done. Uh, this is a similar towards figuring out fraud, figuring out hackers. If I tell you how they're doing it currently, we lose some competitive advantage because then they'll figure out a different way to do it. 
Um, but we, we take a, a lot of care in sort of teasing that out. All right. And so using data points on individual players, like identifying strengths and weaknesses, could Riot Games effectively predict the outcome of individual matches? Um, effectively is the key word there. Uh, or or so, are you trying to do this? Well, so to some extent, there is internally some thought about trying to understand win rates at, at various levels to better understand the game design. Um, so for those very, uh, so this person is uh, very familiar with the game. Um, and so we have a phase where there's picks and bans. So there is, when you go, okay, so there are multiple phases. First phase is you've just met, been made into a match. There are now 10 people who are gonna play against each other. They have various skill levels. Um, we have systems that predict skill levels. Um, we try to choose matches that are fair. Um, so we, we tend to sort of bias towards 50% win rate. Um, although that's not always true, and I can't speak a ton to the details of that. But so we predict at that level. Then we look at picks and bans, where you're choosing which champions to go. Some matchups are better than others, um, which will change that 50% win rate in different ways. Um, and then we look at every minute of the game and try to predict who's going to win at every step. Um, and so there, we're really trying to bring tools to our designers to help them understand effectively whether or not the game's balanced, whether people are having fun playing it, whether there are important decisions to be made. Um, yeah, and so that's sort of how we tend to think about that problem. That's cool. That was my question, so that was a fun <laughs> answer. Yeah. Um, you can use the churn percentage to decide if you apply an action to a customer or not. But given 20 possible actions you can apply, how do you choose the best one? Uh, so I, I can talk to this one a little bit. So the team that I run uh, currently um, is called the AI Accelerator. Our, so Riot Games has multiple games in development. Um, and one of the things we want to do is help designers build balanced games before they have players. Um, and so there we're building lots of AI similar to DeepMind and, and OpenAI for learning to play those games so that we can play them at various skill levels and tell them if it's balanced. Um, and, and through that process, we're using deep reinforcement learning. Um, and given if I had designers come to me and I say, say they have these 20 interventions to play with, uh, I'm certain that one of my data scientists would be like, please let me throw a multi-arm bandit at it. Um, please let me start playing with it that way. Um, and so we would try various schemes around that. All right. Time for a few more. Regarding survival and an analysis, it often happens that the co-varieties aren't time Invariant. <laughs> wow. It depends when it happened. Did you encounter this problem? How did you deal with it? Um, this is an interesting question. So the way we sort of looked at this, um, so this is one of the reasons that I want, I love the time to event model, um, because you're capturing that as you move through. And we use some recurrent networks there to play with that. Um, in the survival analysis one, what we do is we try to take a sample across all time. Um, and hopefully in that sample, we're seeing players at different phases of their life cycle um, so that we can sort of capture, it's, this is a wishy-washy answer, but capture that time invariant um, or capture the, the things that vary with time. Um, and so that's ultimately how we did it, was just throw more data at the problem, which isn't a very satisfying answer. How do you determine which elements of a patch you causally impact user retention when there are so many interaction events? Do you hold out specific changes? Um, so we have not actually tested at that level yet. Um, so when, we talk, I, when I talk about leveraging the patch there, we're leveraging the features that we have. We're not actually tracking the individual champion features or uh, at that level, sort of the balance of, say, Summoner's Rift or ARAM. Um, we can, though, look at, like, a new game mode appears, and that would have an effect on uh, re user retention. Um, there are a ton of interaction effects. Um, we do not hold out specific changes, um, and we tend to look at a, a high, higher level to sort of avoid dealing with the interaction effects. All right, from <laughs> mid or feed, how do you, I'm not, I'm not sure, I'm, I missed it, so I don't know. <laughs> Mid or feed, it's a, someone's calling their lane, and if they don't get it, they're going to intentionally feed. Oh. <laughs> How 
how do you deal with smurfing or elo boosting? Do those accounts stand in during analytics slash does it make an impact? Does it make an impact on matching algorithms? Sorry, my reading is bad right now. <laughs> this is a fantastic question and it almost bit me in the ass before this uh, talk. Um, so there are a lot of boosted accounts. There are a lot of accounts, uh, well not a lot, but we have uh, people who will um, basically bots that will grind to level 30 so that they can sell the account because you have to hit level 30 before you can play in ranked. Um, and, and we don't sell accounts so you have to do that grind for each one of your accounts. And if you've hit our punishment systems and had your account removed, you need a new account, you don't necessarily want to go through the grind. Um, so this black market of accounts uh, being sold has existed. And so we do, we have teams in place that sort of try to detect those bot farms and when they're sort of running up these accounts. Um, and in fact, when I was pulling some of the graphs, um, I was getting some terrible results and, and I had totally forgotten to remove um, these bots. And what I was seeing was I was trying to find up a nice pretty graph uh, of the 800 games one. And what I ended up seeing was someone had played 200 to 300 games over Christmas break. Um, and it was like the number of hours in the day, so there, there was just no sleep. And so they, they grant, so it was a computer obviously playing the, the games, um, but it, I was like, <laughs> at first I was trying to figure out what, what child got out of school or what young adult got out of school and went and just started playing League of Legends nonstop without sleep for uh, 20, or for two weeks. Um, and, <laughs> and then it, it dawned on me that, oh yeah, there's no way that physically, I don't think that's possible to actually pull this off. Um, and so we we're able to easily sort of detect and, and pull those out of the data set so that they don't taint our analysis. All right, we have a few more minutes. Can so get... can we get riot stickers? <laughs> <laughs> Damn it, I didn't bring any. I, I, I should have. Um, I forgot to swing by our swag booth and grab a bunch. It's probably an online store somewhere, no? We don't sell riot stickers, I don't think. We sell lots huh. of uh, League of Legends stuff, but I don't huh. know if we sell stickers. Well. Is there a plan to open, is there a plan to add open AI trained bot challenges to League of Legends? Um, so this is a really uh, fun story. Um, I'm happy to chat more about it offline. Um, odds are no. Um, we have gone back and forth on this. We have bots. Uh, we revamp them once every five to six years. <laughs> um, they stay stagnant. They sort of fall out of the meta. They provide an experience for players. But ultimately, when we think about the experience we want for players and that we're trying to craft, it's that PvP experience. It's that social interaction between people. So building out uh, super highly well-trained uh, bots is not, how, it's not the most engaging form or how um, majority of our players want to engage uh, with our uh, game. That being said, that um, the other one that we always, internally we used to pitch this idea a lot. So, um, OpenAI hadn't announced it yet, uh, hadn't announced that they were actually competing um, with Dota 2 yet. And so internally, I had been working with Joe Tung, who's the senior or executive producer for League, uh, to try to pitch this idea with him. And, and he, what we realized over the course of about three different times we tried to pitch it to him, is like, I don't really want to play against a bot that's as good as Faker, who's the best in the world, uh, arguably still, um, because I would just get totally smashed and it wouldn't be fun. Um, and so. <laughs> Uh, finding what we've sort of settled on is what we want to do is be able to find a way that we can build bots that can drop in at any, at any ELO um, and so that they play as well as you do and sort of give you an engaging uh, experiences. All right. This next one, maybe you kind of answered so we can go over it, but okay. a lot of players have multiple accounts. Smurfs, how does yeah. this affect your calculations? Maybe we already answered. So the Smurfs are slightly different than the last one. These are players who know how to play the game and have just started a new account. Uh, we take great care to sort of identify them uh, so that when we do analysis on the, the, gr uh, the, the growth from level 1 to 30, that we take into account those players who are just playing their second account, they understand the game so that we can tease out the effects for those that are actually learning the game. Um, and we have different techniques for pulling that out. All right, maybe for the final question, what are the data challenges you've found in your ETL solution? Oh, this, there are so many horror stories um, in this. Um, one of my favorites is the first um, personalized offers that I ran, or Your Secret Shop. Um, we have this account, we have a table called Store, uh, Store Transactions. And on it, it has a store, or it has an account ID, 
and then a store account ID. No, it was account ID and ID. And we have another table that has summoner ID, account ID. And so I think overall, every player has about seven different IDs scattered across different tables. Um, and I didn't know which ID I was supposed to join to for uh, the store transactions to the account details. And I ended up joining account ID to ID. And that was your store ID, which is a unique ID given to you when you first go to the store for the first time. So none of the store stuff matched up well. Um, and it caused huge problems <laughs> in terms of being able to make sure I filtered out the things that you had already purchased. Um, and so that's just one of the ways in which we've coded up identifier in every different team has created a different identifier seemingly for our League of Legends players, which has been a nightmare to track. Um, that's one of them. There's a lot more, and we can chat more over there. All right. Well, that sounds like a good time. You can find him after at the Prezi, st at the Prezi booth to go into some more informal Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you.